Okay, welcome back. Welcome back to track D, track D, day two, afternoon. Track D, uh, real disruption, how technology is changing and challenging real estate. We have three great sessions on this. We have three great sessions on this real disruption uh, conversation that we've had for a while here at MIT at the Center for Real Estate. And I am very pleased um, to kick it off with the session. We're revisiting blockchain two years ago Avi Spielman, a, a student uh, in the Mesred program, uh, stopped me in the hall and he said, Steve, I want to I wanna write my thesis on blockchain. So, you know, well, yeah, what's blockchain? I had no idea. And um, so he explained it to me and it, uh, as we know, it has unfolded over the last 24 months about this new technology, technology that is um, as um, um, uh, MIT Technology Review says that uh, blockchain is to transactions what the internet was to information. It's an infrastructure technology that's going to allow amazing things. And um, to have this conversation, I'm going to turn it over to Avi and his guests, and we'll get an update on where we've come over the last 24-ish months and a little bit about where we're headed. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Good afternoon, everyone. How are we all doing? Have a good lunch? Feeling a little sleepy, maybe? You know, ready to go? Uh, before I begin, I do want to uh, acknowledge uh, some of my professors who are in the room um, and advisors. Of course, Steve Weichel has been, become a close friend. Uh, I wrote my thesis on this topic. My thesis advisor is somewhere in here, John Kennedy. Here you are, John. So I just wanted to thank you all. Um, and thank you to the MIT Center for Real Estate for hosting a continuation of this panel. Two years ago at the World Real Estate Forum 2016, maybe for the first time anywhere, a small but incredibly well-dressed group of believers posed the question, how will blockchain change the real estate industry? Traditionally, we start these sessions with a different question. By a show of hands, who here has ever heard of blockchain? Wow. Wow. That's good. I don't even have to ask the second question, because back then I had to say, who here has ever heard of Bitcoin? And then everyone would raise their hand, or a few people would raise their hand, and I'd be like, great, they have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> but uh, even now, uh, in my uh, notes, I say pause for a dramatic effect. I think when we first talked about this, uh, this, this conversation, uh, nobody knew what the heck we were talking about. I'm glad to hear that the, uh, the room is well-versed. Uh, the purpose of today's panel is not to talk about what is blockchain or answer those lingering technical questions that are still a bit confusing regarding the technology, but to highlight the progress in how blockchain is reshaping the real estate industry from where it was to where it is to where it's going. That being said, we'll start with a quick high-level overview of blockchain and its potential areas of intersection within the real estate industry. From there, we will transition over to our fabulous panel of practitioners to learn more about their take on our burning quandaries, leaving some time at the end to take questions from our wonderful audience. OK, so here we go. Blockchain is a distributed ledger. The end. <laughs> that is everything now you need to know about what the heck it is that we're talking about. As a distributed ledger, a partial or complete copy of the ledger lives on every node, computer, connected to the network. Since the ledger is digital, all copies of the ledger can sync, updating through the work of competing parties, known as miners, who work through an established consensus system to validate the data. Each update forms a block of information, which is added to the previous block of information, so forth and so on, creating a chain, hence block chain. So why is this important? So glad you asked. Organizing information in this manner reveals the true innovation behind blockchain, removing the need for a central authority. How does this affect real estate? Let's focus on a piece of the capitalism side of the conversation as opposed to the humanitarianism side and talk about two ways that blockchain applications, if adopted, can affect change. One, provide existing services. And two is reimagine existing services. Providing existing services is the simplest form of adoption. 
Service as a software, SaaS companies, for example, popularized by the advent of this thing called the interweb, is an example of an existing service provider. By introducing blockchain applications, neither the companies nor the services they provide change the way their consumers continue to conduct business. However, the use of blockchain technology will likely enhance the core elements of service functionality, including transparency or security. There are now more than a handful of examples of real estate blockchain companies taking this approach. One that falls into this category is RealBlox, who's here with us today. Reimagining existing services can make them more efficient, fluid, and accessible. Crowdfunding, actual ownership, REIT distribution payments, and home equity loans represent just a few examples of existing services that could be significantly improved and more widely utilized through the creative application and the integration of blockchain technology. In this case, instead of an ever-increasing, I'm sorry, in this case, the uh, market segment as a whole may grow, expanding the entire financial pie. Similarly, rather than reimagining existing services, we can simply re-engineer existing systems by hanging blockchain functionality, term I stole from you, Sandy, uh, at certain steps of a given system workflow. Here, the blockchain would function as a component within a larger array of technologies, such as cloud services or IoT, Internet of Things, uh, coming to a future world real estate forum near you, that combine to provide an improved package of services and better system management. Companies such as CProp are currently tackling this complex but promising arena of system workflow, workflow streamlining within the greater context of managing the complete chain of events that constitute a real estate transaction. Does it still all sound too good to be true? Yesterday, it was reported that $1.3 billion has been invested in blockchain companies already in 2018 alone. Yet another headline read that one in five ICOs, initial coin offerings, are fraudulent. Is it still the Wild West? Or can we invest with confidence in this space? Fortunately, to answer some of these questions, we have a fantabulous panel of experts. So Sandy, why don't we start off with you? Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, talk about what you're doing in your company and what brought you here to our wonderful forum. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so I'm Sandy Selman. I'm one of the co-founders of CProp, uh, which is an acronym my younger partners tell me we have to say CProp and not Crypto Properties, which is the actual name of the company. So I follow their lead. Uh, so we're a bunch of business guys, actually, that came from different walks of the real estate market. Um, and uh, Essentially what we uh, were doing, we were working on other things. And while we were working on those other things, we got involved in trading crypto. So we got involved in trading Bitcoin and other, other uh, alt currencies, and, uh, which uh, some people regard as fun. It's always fun when the market's going up, and when it's not, it's not so much fun, but it's another subject. Um, but we got, uh, it got us interested in what the underlying technology was, this blockchain technology. And, um, because real estate uh, is such a, a massive market with so much data and so much capital flowing every day, every minute, every second, we thought, gosh, there's got to be some interesting use cases for blockchain that actually have commercial significance, not just some crazy commercial paradigm that uh, we'll never see the light of day. And so we formed CProp really to um, uh, develop applications where we could take this technology in a, in, 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 in a sort of a commercially grounded way and apply it to real world problems that we all feel um, where we can actually derive commercial value. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Very nice, thank you. Aman. Sure, uh, thank you everyone for coming here. So my background in blockchain goes back to different country, India, and uh, in a very <coughs> different topic that was land titles. Uh, this is in 2013 and 2014. I was doing uh, research in uh, land title and how to modernize them. Uh, that is where we thought, okay, blockchain is something, a new tech that is coming up and we should explore that. We ended up not, but that was when I first read or worked on blockchain. Subsequently, um, when I was at Harvard, uh, I, did, I got interested at uh, blockchain applications in real estate because I felt real estate industry is uh, set for disruption and blockchain has many use cases in real estate. So 
Uh, I did uh, undertake a year-long research studying different startups, uh, their value propositions, what is their business model, what is their underlying tech, and how are they, they plan to bring about disruption in real estate. So, and then I got to know, it's an interesting story that originated here in Media Lab because um, the founder, we are the uh, real blocks. Uh, we are like a small team that uh, recently graduated from Barclays Techstars. Uh, the founder of the team, uh, Perrin Kwar, she was doing blockchain research at Media Labs here. And uh, when I was at Harvard, we, we met at a bar. Uh, we shared our <laughs> conversation on blockchain and thought, OK, this is something uh, interesting that uh, we would like to work together. And uh, so for real blocks, one of the major pain points that we are solving is bringing down the real estate investments to as low as $50. Uh, that is for short time. Long time, we do want to bring it as low as less than, less, uh, less than a dollar. Uh, not only for U.S., but also for global investment, uh, investors. And um, make the process very efficient, very liquid. Real estate investments ha have been highly illiquid, very local uh, process. So we want to change that using blockchain tech. You keep mentioning, uh, I think you called it Harvard. Is that a university here in Boston as well? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, last time I checked I've it heard was. It. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a side note, Naman is actually receiving his master's from Harvard this Thursday. So a little congratulations. Yeah. On <laughs> James, AKA JP, yes. please. Hi, uh, I'm JP Brennan. Um, I'm a director at Duff and Phelps uh, out of the New York office. Um, and I'm glad that they went for me because I essentially advise them on um, regulatory and compliance issues when setting up various um, funds, exchanges, crypto related, um, but also real estate funds. So. Fantastic. Now, we learned a little bit about some of what the companies do. Sandy, you've been doing this now for a couple years in the space. Tell me, how is, what was the reception like to a blockchain business uh, when you first started out? And maybe you could accentuate that with a little bit about where your travels have been recently with what the, the not just local U.S. Uh, market interest is, but what are, what's, what's the conversation going on globally? What yeah, are people sure. talking about? So when you had everyone raise uh, hands about how many people have heard of blockchain, most of the people raised their hands. Can I just have a show of hands? How many people actually think they understand what blockchain is? Yeah, there, that's about, Wait, that's, that's about. not fair. He's, the, he's like an MIT superstar right now. <laughs> <laughs> so a few ringers on the audience. Um, so the, the short answer, that, that actually is the short answer. Everybody's interested in it, but um, uh, everybody who's in business is struggling with understanding how you actually get commercial traction with it. And that phenomena is not limited to the real estate sector. It's in financial services, it's in logistics, it's in you know, entertainment, all the verticals where you see blockchain companies proliferating. Um, so, uh, and, and the reason for that, in, in my opinion anyway, is that in order for blockchain to come into the real world, the mainstream world that we all live in, um, you need to have not only uh, technical feasibility, but you have to have commercial viability. And commercial viability means a lot of things, particularly is what can it do for me to improve my situation, can improve my, my performance, can improve my P&L, can improve or reduce my risk. Um, and unless you can make that sort of commercial use case clearly, succinctly, quantify it, uh, and, and put it across in a way that people can understand it and engage with it, it's never gonna see the light of day. So that's kind of the perspective that, that we had when we embarked on this journey. And, and what we saw a lot of other companies uh, doing um, uh, in the real estate sector was they were starting with the idea that blockchain was a solution to a need, but they hadn't really clearly identified the need, particularly with respect to this commercial uh, uh, viability metric. And um, so what we did was we kind of turned the pipe around the other way and said, let's, saw, let's, let's um, identify a problem that we can develop a, a data-driven solution to. And then once we have uh, kind of vetted that solution in terms of its technical com and commercial marketability and viability, let's look at it and see, does blockchain actually have a role? And if the answer is no, it's no, and we'll move on. But in our case, we found that we, we developed something where blockchain does deliver very specific value and very specific, um, some very specific aspects. And the market reception, consequently, from, from the industry as we've traveled the world, has been extremely positive. I'm very, very gratified by it. Yeah, I think you bring up a very important point. You know, blockchain is in headlines all the time now. It used to be uh, this word where if you'd never heard of it, I'd say, now that you have, you're going to see it everywhere you look. Mm. And part of that is when 
in being in the blockchain industry, people come to us with great ideas and great businesses and great applications. The first thing we always say is, great, can you do it without blockchain? And the answer is usually yes. And the answer, then, so the next question is, so why do you need blockchain? Why is that important? And maybe, Naman, you can talk about how it's going to, uh, how blockchain is an integral part of what you're trying to do at Real Blocks. Yeah, sure. But uh, I'll answer that and uh, something I'll add on to that, uh, what uh, Sandy said. That, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we all use internet, but a very small percentage of us would be able to tell how internet actually works. So, so from that perspective, blockchain is a tool, is a, is a way to get, achieve a particular end. So we, as a customer, we need not to understand how blockchain works, because as long as the end product is something which is useful, something that is they can rely on, something that is secure, so, so education of blockchain is not necessary for the development of the industry for, for the masses. So for in our case, in real blocks, we are focusing on real estate investing. So education of customers for, uh, on blockchain is not something that is a part of our business strategy because that is, a diver that is something that is not core to our model. What we are instead focusing on education and say real estate investing, that's because that is the core aim that we are trying to solve. And uh, for us, the blockchain is important because, because of three reasons. Uh, first is that it improves the transactions, which I guess uh, your model is based on by a lot. It makes it, it, makes it decentralized, it makes it secure, it uh, increases the efficiency in terms of time as well. Second is blockchain provides a very good case for capital raising. I mean, whether we like it or not, ICOs, Yep. I mean, there are billions of dollars have been raised using an ICOs, and it proves this is, this is I believe this is the only very successful case of blockchain tech <laughs> till date. I mean, oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> there are others, but this is the most successful if we count in terms of capital raised. So, so blockchain provides an ICO mechanism or uh, provides a very good way to raise capital. That is where we are using it uh, there. And the third part is blockchain has this concept of tokenization. So tokenization is very much similar to securitization, but securitization is bounded by legal environment in a particular country. Tokenization is, has a more global approach, more the tokens that are created by dividing an asset, a physical asset, can be traded across globally on exchanges. So that is the third value prop blockchain is adding for us in our model. We've actually seen uh, somewhat of a, a full cycle, if you will, for lack of a better term, where in the beginning, uh, people were just throwing blockchain into their name or just because they knew it was the hot new thing, right? You saw Kodak said, oh, we got blockchain stock jumps, you know, a uh, bazillion percent. Um, but um, we've seen now a return to that where companies that are utilizing blockchain technology have removed blockchain from their name or from their explanation for the very reason that uh, their purpose of what they're doing is not blockchain. They're doing something that utilizes blockchain and they find that people get lost in the blockchain side of things, get confused in the blockchain side of things, and so it actually is difficult for them to provide uh, an explanation of what they're really trying to accomplish. Um, and, and, I, and I think on, on, on that note, I think um, I wrote an article uh, last month. It's called uh, The Curious Case of the Crypto. So to his point, you know, there was an iced tea company in Long Island that added crypto iced tea or something to it. And their stock went up to 150 million dollars. It was it was an iced tea company. There was they did nothing else. Delicious iced tea. No. Iced tea, and it probably wasn't even that good. <laughs> but um, you know that's one of the, these things is you know people don't really understand. They hear something and they want to be involved and they have that that fear of missing out as a human that we all have. And they want to you know oh I'm going to buy you know 100 dollars worth of Bitcoin. Well, do you really know what Bitcoin is? Um, do you really know what you're getting into? Do you understand what blockchain is actually doing? in the background. It's a pretty easy concept. It's a ledger. And it just keeps building and building and building and building. Um, and as an accountant, you know, I think that's huge for us because the big thing that we're interested in is, is accurate transactions and, and efficiency. And blockchain literally changes the dynamic for the accounting industry. In fact, uh, just to add to that, uh, something very similar happened in dot-com bubble, for example. Companies used to, used to add a dot-com to their... Yeah, right. <laughs> right. That's right. And, uh, and their stocks oh, jumped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you, you know, it's interesting. You allude to um, an important part of where we've been and where we are now. In the very beginning, this was very much considered the Wild West, similar to the advent of the Internet, um, where there were a lot of players in the field, and 
a lot of big money like there is now being thrown around. How do you know who's for real? How do you know what's legit? If this is a new technology, how are we making sure that there's compliance? How are we making sure that everything is being regulated? How important is that? Um, and so I'm sure for all of your companies, those are questions that you face all the time. Um, how do you address these, those, those questions, those topics? Yeah, I guess I'll start with that. It's a loaded question. And I don't want to dwell on the negative because there's plenty <laughs> of negative to dwell on. There's actually a lot of positive I'd like people to come away with too. Um, but to just dwell on the negative for a second. Um, so from a compliance standpoint, the US government, this SEC in particular, is really struggling with this concept of tokens and how to regulate them. And are they, should they be, should, are they, do they come under the jurisdiction of the Securities Acts or do they not? And the answer to that question is, well, maybe. Um, and the U.S. is lagging behind um, a lot of other countries in the formulation of policy, much less the rules that are going to govern the sector. So if you have a business that's like your business, I'm on, where your token is clearly um, fits the definition of security, I think you would agree with that. Yeah. In, in our case, our token does not. If, in fact, if our token becomes regulated as security, it, it, defeats, the, it defeats our business model. Um, so uh, what we've had to do is we've had to take the decision to actually move our business outside the US, um, set up a completely separate entity to actually do the token sale, and to preclude US investors from participating in that token sale, just to create distance from the regulations. Now, once it's all said and done, and we go and, and, and uh, go put those tokens into business use, into the commercial use case that we have, yep. it's not an issue. They're like frequent flyer points. But for purposes of the token sale, it's a real rat's nest for, okay. for here. You're not the only ones doing this. I mean, we're seeing this all the time, where because of uh, regulations, the U.S. trying to catch up with what's going on, they sort of put a, a hard stop, if you will, on a lot of the topics. Um, and so people are have vi viable businesses or, or sort of scrambling to figure out what the best move is for them. Yeah, we, I mean, we actually took the decision not lightly. Um, and we just, I, I mean, I was at a conference in San Juan where a lot of blockchain people are moving because of the tax, the new tax uh, rules there. and. Um, I, I sat at you know at yet another conference with yet another panel of lawyers talking about how to comply with U.S. rules around token issuances, and it was it was just um, it was completely nuts. And I turned to my partner and I said, "We have a great business here. We have a great product. We've got customers. We've you know this is going to be great, but we're contaminating contaminating it by trying to find, figure out a solution to how we comply with U.S. law. And if we just remove that from the equation." Then we can just, now we can move forward. Now we can lurch forward. And that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. I just couldn't take listening to these lawyers anymore. <laughs> that was bizarre, because most people love listening to lawyers. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> our favorite, it's our favorite thing to do, especially in real estate, right? Uh, Naman, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, or? sure. So, um, uh, sorry, do you have a? I think it's a great question, thank you. And we're gonna answer that question right now. Do you have time at the end for questions? Just throwing that out there for, for the moving forward, moving forward. Um, but I mean, do you wanna talk a little bit more about token itself and what a token is and yeah. why your token is different, let's say, than Naman's token? So just, just like a few quick definitions. So um, you're absolutely right. Cryptocur the subject of cryptocurrency and blockchain are two different subjects. So all the Bitcoin and the trading and the tokens and all stuff is all this cryptocurrency stuff. But the blockchain is the underlying technology that, that allows all that stuff to happen. You, can, you can't have cryptocurrency trading without blockchain, but you can have blockchain without crypto. Um, so that's sort of a foundational concept. Um, and then there's the, the question of, um, with these cryptocurrencies, there's things called tokens and there's things called coins. Coins are, are, are how do you want to call them, units of measure, units of, of value that actually trade on their uh, on blockchains of their own name. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, those trade, Bitcoin trades on the Bitcoin block, uh, works on the Bitcoin blockchain, Ethereum works on the Ethereum blockchain. Tokens are a um, similar concept, but they use blockchains of someone else. So in our case, our token, our, our company, will function on the Ethereum blockchain. So um, the issue is, I think your question is, um, the whole, the whole uh, question around how the tokens, whether they're tokens or coins, how are they regulated? And um, the fact is that there are literally dozens of exchanges around the world that, we're, that have unbelievable amount of liquidity. It's just, it's crazy how much, how much volume there is in Bitcoin, for example, um, as well as a number of other tokens, where the trading of these things uh, happens. Um, it's liquid, it's fluid, it's legal. Um, 
But in the U.S., it's, it's, it's quite a bit more complicated. I mean, an analogy to that, but not the best one, but that is something that I can think of right now, is consider token as uh, tickets to a baseball game, right? You can, so your business model is that baseball game, but you can have the tickets as a utility for, and distribute it to the people so they can come to your business and do their transactions or whatever. Or, but tickets are not essential for the functioning of that baseball game. Does that make sense or, yeah. And I also think to your point is, you know, things kind of get crossed because people are using ICOs, the mechanism of ICOs, to raise money. If you have, and, and, and I'll say this to anyone that comes to me with, you know, this brilliant idea. If it's so brilliant, why not do a private placement? You're creating an, an additional layer of all of this work that you don't need to do, complying with U.S. regulations or not. Do we go, have to go outside the U.S.? Well, if, it, if you believe in it, and, you know, you'll be able to raise the money. But I think to your point, it, it kind of gets kind of crossed because it's an easy way to, to raise money. Um, crowdfunding, another you know, similar easy way. Um, but they're actually using the money, or sorry, a lot of times they're using the money to create their business um, and, and, and create businesses like these that are, are legitimate. Not everyone obviously is legitimate, and that's, you know, you still need to do your due diligence when you're, when you're um, looking into investing in some of these ICOs or some of these blockchain companies, um, and it's traditional due, di due diligence. Um, and, you know, that, that's something that these guys could, you know, really talk to you about is, you know, when they're deploying funds and, 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 and actually accepting funds, because that's a big issue with AML and KYC. So, JP, along those lines, when does someone bring in a compliance specialist if they're starting a blockchain company? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, you know, we work closely with attorneys in the beginning. So um, having the discussion of what your end goal is, what, what is it that you want to do? What, do you, what is it that you want to accomplish? Because um, that'll help determine what sort of investors that you're going to accept cash from. So whether it's U.S., whether it's outside the U.S., um, because then we need to figure out where do we want to set up the company. Is it going to be a U.S.-based company? So we're using Delaware as an example. Or are we going to do it outside the U.S. in Cayman or BVI or somewhere else? Um, and then from, once we have that, we're working with your attorneys to, to really write the actual policies and procedures from an, AM, an, an AML and KYC perspective. Um, Explain what KYC is. To know your customer. So um, when you're actually receiving investment money, um, it, it, and, and again, this leads to another question. So all these different questions are some rabbit holes that we could probably delve into uh, when you guys have questions later on. But um, one of the conversations that you need to have is, are you going to accept fiat, so, so US dollars, or are you going to accept crypto? Because that really determines um, the, 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 the sort of framework that we need to implement in your company. Um, and so from that, from there, moving forward, you then need to set up the, the security platform properly. Um, and I have a colleague of mine who actually co-authored the cryptocurrency security standard. Um, it's, a, it's a tough word to get out. But um, it's something that a lot of ICOs, a lot of exchanges, a lot of funds are using on their platform so that they don't get hacked. Um, you know, people, you know, in the business that I'm in, people usually come to us after something bad happens as opposed to being proactive and doing it correctly from the beginning. Um, and I think that's an important aspect that, that people really need to see. Um, a lot of these, these I'll say kids because I'm a little bit older, um, that are 22, 23 years old that are much more brilliant than I am, but they don't know how to set up a company. They see, you know, we need to raise, have a, have a $100 million cap raise right away, but they're not setting up a sustainable company. Um, and I think that's the important thing that we're trying to get across and trying to help um, um, these entrepreneurs with. Gotcha. So I think it also might be helpful for the audience if we had a little bit of an idea of what type of projects are you guys working on? Where do you see the applications of what your business is, work, is trying to accomplish with real world application? Yeah, I love that question. So the problem that we were solving for was the difficulty and the friction associated with closing residential real estate transactions, particularly long distance. So across the another city, across the country, and another country. and. Um, Transacting uh, and buying property is um, a pretty much everywhere you go in the world is a manual uh, labor intensive process. Um, and if you're transacting at a distance, um, the buyers are at a disadvantage because they don't know what they're getting into when they start the transaction. And when they're in the transaction, they don't necessarily know where they are and when it's gonna end. Um, and there's a lot of stress associated with that. So, so the original problem that we were solving for was to create a, a transaction management platform 
that provides 100% transparency on all the workflows, all the documentation, all the tasks associated with getting a deal closed so that everybody involved in the deal could see what's going on at all points in time, permissioned, of course. Um, and so then, so that element of it has zero to do with blockchain. Mm -hmm. okay? And so is there a need for that? You know, we market tested it. We talked to a bunch of people, did market surveys, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, the answer is there's a need for that. All right, so the next question was, um, what role, if any, does blockchain play in that? Or can we hang some blockchain technology on this to actually make it more valuable? And, and so when we went around the world uh, uh, talking to people about that aspect of it, what we discovered is that, yeah, there are a couple of places where having blockchain uh, on this platform does make sense. So for example, here's one really good example. Many parts of the world where um, you have to post escrows uh, to get a deal done, but in the country that you're working in, finding trusted escrow agents is very, very problematic or very, very expensive. So a really nifty use of blockchain technology is to write a smart contract, which is uh, just a fancy name for a, for a, a contract that's written in computer code, it's self-executing, where you could post that escrow uh, into an account, into a wallet in, in essence, and the disposition of the proceeds of that wallet would be determined by the code that you've written beforehand as opposed to some escrow agent that you don't know if they're gonna abscond with the money or make the right decision. So um, it's, a perfect, it's a perfect use case, it's a perfect technical use case, and in large parts of the world, it's a, it's a very valuable commercial use case, so that's, that's one example. Uh, another area where we found it, it made a lot of sense was um, in situations, and again, it occurs in many parts of the world, including here, um, where long distance buyers don't trust the legal system in which they're transacting. And so having all of their closing documents, including their title records, authenticated to the blockchain, provides them with an added measure of security that makes them feel good. Now, does it deliver any tangible commercial value in terms of dollars and cents? Mm -mm, I would argue that it probably doesn't, but it does reduce their perceived risk, and that is a, that's something that's valuable. And it doesn't cost hardly anything to provide that added layer of security. So that was a, a second element that we incorporated. Nice. Right. Uh, I, uh, I already touched a bit on what uh, we are doing. So uh, if you guys are familiar with Stash Invest, Stash Invest is a very bus successful business that allows people to invest in stocks and ETFs at a minimum of $5. So we at RealBlox see ourselves as Stash Invest for RealBlox because we eventually want to bring, out, bring down that minimum to, we are starting with $50, but as I mentioned, we want to do it for a global market for less than a dollar. And we believe there is a huge market opportunity there. Globally, we estimate there are more than two billion people that would be interested in such a product. And um, yeah, and yeah. Is it a project by project basis? Oh uh, no, so we are doing, uh, so we have, we are set up as a marketplace uh, where we have supply partners and then the demand uh, side, uh, which, is, which comes from the crypto world as well as fiat world. So our supply partners are REITs, family offices, big brokerages, and uh, people uh, with developers and people who have real estate ownership. So they can list their uh, portfolios or they can list their individual asset on our platform and we do the tokenization and sell those tokens in the market. Right now, our, this is what we plan to do, but uh, as again, we were talking about the legal environment and the compliance issues, that is it's still not possible US because we are focusing US in US real estate market, this which we feel is like the most uh, lucrative market uh, compared to other real estate markets. So, so right now we are going with a strategy of taking portfolios of REITs and uh, right now non-traded REITs and providing them with liquidity on the blockchain by selling the shares of non-traded REITs in the market. Very nice. So where do you guys see this going? Clearly you're, in, you're invested in this space um, and you're continuing to be invested in this space. Um, talk a little bit about the traction and what you see as the future of where we're going with this. In our, in our case, so we, we just, I guess the final piece of our business model, which I didn't explain, is that we're not a B2C business, we're a B2B business. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is we're now taking this platform, this transaction environment with the little blockchain elements to it, and we are white labeling it to property portals around the world so that um, we tap into their listing databases and their web traffic and we give those property portals a way to make their customer relationships more sticky. So uh, to make an example, if I go to Trulia today and I click on a property of interest, I'm interested in buying something in Seattle, um, I click on that property and I'm given the coordinates of the, of the listing broker and now I have to figure out myself who to, who to hire and how to do, get the deal done and, and so on. In, in, in our scenario, 
we place a button on that Trulia website, they click on it, and then uh, and the button would say something like, you know, let Trulia help me buy this property. Um, uh, and I'd enter into a transaction environment under the branding of the portal, which is the known brand, because who knows us? Nobody. Um, and it allows the, the, them to then safely and securely and transparently get all the way to the closing table. Yeah, for me, I'll, I'll take a step back and treat this question from a sector level, like real estate blockchain. So if you see there are certain verticals, I see the entire sector to be developing. The first one is uh, land titles and registry. So there are a lot of startups, a lot of companies who are actually working in this domain. What they're essentially trying to do is to convert uh, titles that are presently held, uh, held in a county and transferring that onto the blockchain. So again, it's, since it is a distributed ledger, that, that has an immense value proposition. Another one is more about data play. Real estate is a very data uh, intensive industry. And these platforms are trying to build an alternative uh, MLS system, the multi uh, market listing services, uh, which uh, brokerages use. And um, so they are trying, it's, right now the data is very guarded behind uh, big cor like corporations, and they are trying to decentralize that. So there's another play there. Then uh, third use case is more on transactions, which I guess uh, CPROP is doing, and we are also touching upon that, is blockchain adds a lot of value in the transactions. So that is, um, and that is, that can d definitely be tapped into. Um, the fourth one is, uh, which uh, I'm not uh, entirely convinced of, is setting up a P2P rental services, much like Air Airbnb. So this is, this is more like a, a blockchain solution finding for a problem. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, the, uh, but the idea behind these platforms is they are kind of setting up an alternative Airbnb using blockchain. And uh, since uh, it's on blockchain, it's more of peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, well, I don't know much about it, honestly. <laughs> uh, and the last one, which is interesting, is uh, raising capital on blockchain. So this is more about uh, raising using blockchain and the capital that is on digital currencies. Uh, and deploying, finding means to deploy that capital into the real estate industry. I mean, let's, let's not underst underestimate this because right now it's a market cap of digital currencies is like $400 billion. Yeah. So even if 1% or like 2% of that capital finds a good channel for in the real estate investment business, that's, that's a big, uh, that's some, something worth doing into. JP, what about, uh, who are the stakeholders in this? Who are the people, the regulators who are keeping an eye on what's going on? So I, I think it's going to be all your, you know, the, the, the typical names that you hear, all those three-letter acronyms, maybe four letters sometimes. So the SEC, the CFTC, the IRS, um, the state level is really coming down um, on this and, and really trying to, to, to get its hands around it. Um, I think we're at the point in time, you know, and, and I may disagree a little bit with what Sandy was saying earlier on about, about the regulators. Um, they're, not that new, they're not that new to the game. Um, the SEC... Uh, has uh, set up an internal committee looking at this two to three years ago. Um, you know, they, they recently sent out a request for information to a lot of the uh, big name um, exchanges, ICOs, uh, and funds. Um, in doing so, they're trying to figure out who the real players are um, and who the bad actors are in this space because they just don't really know. Nobody really knows at this point in time. Um, and you have, you know, and, and I'll, I use, kind of use this analogy of, you know, we've had two waves so far. We had the first wave of, of, of all these bad actors that are just trying to raise, uh, just trying to make a ton of money and probably abscond with it and, and leave the country. Um, that was the first wave. The second wave are now people that are being backed by legitimate businesses. Um, and they want to create a sustainable business. And they want to be around in three to five years. Um, so they're playing by the rules. They're setting, you know, wh whether, I, I don't have an opinion whether you set up in the U.S. or, or, or you're non-U.S. based. That's fine. That, that's based on your business model. Um, and and I, that's, you know, a total business decision. Um, but I do believe that SEC, uh, the CFTC, the IRS, they're all working together probably for the first time um, ever. And they're coming at this um, problem with, with a solution. Um, they may not have come down with any sort of regulation, but you'll see in the next six to nine months that by taking their time in, in doing so and understanding what the problems are, what the issues are, who the bad actors are, they're going to have a, a, a better solution than a lot of these other countries who, like China, you know, they just banned everything. Well, now they're like, oh, well, all, all, the, all this money that they could have had are going to other Asian countries or coming here or going to Europe. So that's not the answer either, just to have you know, a quick slap on wrist and say, oh, we're, we're, we're going to ban that. 
take a step back, understand what's going on, and then come at uh, the problem of the solution. So you heard it here first. For the first time ever, the government is working together. <laughs> that's, that's what's going on. Uh, I'm, Different story. There you, go. Uh, there you go. I think it's a very important part. I think, at least in, in my personal experience in this space, um, the people who we think are going to be scared about this, worried about this, title insurance companies, um, you know, registrars, at least from the, the standpoint of recording title, they've been watching this. They, they, they have their finger on the pulse. They've been talking about this far longer than we have. Um, so the idea that this is something that suddenly came out of nowhere um, is not necessarily completely true. Um, not to say that they were prepared, not to say that they were ready and they understand it completely, but this is not, this is not brand new to them either. I think that's actually a, a very important point. Uh, I think we're at the time now we're ready to start to take questions. Um, is there a mic? We had a mic to circulate. We had a mic to circulate? Yes, maybe? No? Maybe? Do now. Do now. <laughs> okay. Please. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name's uh, Raphael Gruber. I work for a real uh, estate developer in Munich. Um, Mr. Brennan, you mentioned that for the first time um, the government is working together. Um, I recently went to a finance forum in Liechtenstein. Um, they are looking to pioneer the regulatory framework uh, with regard to Bitcoin, uh, with regard to um, blockchain, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, are there um, any efforts in setting up international bodies that bring together all these regulatory efforts? No, of course not. <laughs> quick, well, a quick and easy answer, not necessarily, no. Um, but you have a lot of people, especially outside of the US, that are trying to set up, um, or I guess at this point they're, they're sort of working groups, and they're trying to come at some of these problems together. Um, and, and work with each other to, to speak with the regulators in those specific countries. And they're doing it here in the United States as well. There are groups of, of large VCs out in Silicon Valley that are having you know, working sessions with the SEC to, to whether it's trying to influence them or, or trying to explain some of the issues that, 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 that are out there. Um, but you know, people are trying to, trying to trying to decentralize some of the, the regulation that will probably occur. Um, and again, you know, there are some people that don't want regulation, but again, you know, we're, pro we're very early on in, in, in blockchain, Bitcoin, sorry for saying uh, them together, but um, I think with that, you know, some of the regulation will, will, will allow for this institutional money. You know, they said there was $1.3 billion. Well, that's absolutely nothing right now. Absolutely nothing. And people that's created so much wealth. Just wait till there's just a little bit of regulation till someone makes up their mind and you're going to see every large institution get involved. And that's where the real money is going to be made. I agree with that. Yeah. And just to add to that, uh, I have an example of where the legal environment clashes with the technological environment is that, for example, one, one of the debate that Sandy touched upon was whether a token is a security versus a uh, utility token. So. Security token is something that you buy with an expectation that it will rise in value and you will get your return. So appreciation is one of the factors there. And the utility is something that is, as the name suggests, is meant only for utility. So as per, I mean, uh, as per SEC guidelines or as per the legal environment, it says that you should not design your token in such a way that conveys directly or indirectly that its value would rise. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong correct. here. So, but. In, in, on a blockchain, when you, and, and so extended that logic, your token should be an infinite supply, right? I mean, from de, uh, consider it from demand supply sources, if the supply is limited at certain point, the value is supposed to rise. That's, that's simple economics. But on blockchain, you cannot design infinite supply of tokens. That's not how the system works. You have to, in that code itself, you have to tell a number that, okay, I want to issue 50 million or 1 billion tokens so, and, and just to give you a sense of where the problems are in the overlap and something that needs to be resolved. There, there are definitely citizen-led organizations that are trying to work across borders to create change or manifest change and uh, at the very least educate. Uh, and I think we've seen in the news a lot uh, internationally certain countries that have talked about putting their entire nation's database system or title system on the blockchain. Uh, there's been a huge amount of investment in this as well. Uh, Bitfury is a company that's working on it as well um, in Georgia, and part of that is money talks. 
But even locally, we've seen it, uh, for example, in the wonderful state of Tennessee. Anybody else out there living in Tennessee? No? Okay. Uh, in the wonderful state of Tennessee, they recently passed legislation that allowed for digital uh, records, digital notaries like the digital hash, to be recognized in court as admissible um, as uh, a sign of... of um, a few other states have, have also... A few, yeah, definitely there are other states. Delaware is incredibly uh, proactive. Uh, New Hampshire and Vermont have been looking at this for a very long time. Arizona has made a lot of progress on it as well. I guess Illinois too. I'm sorry? Cook, Cook County in Illinois, they are doing a pilot project on land titles using blockchain. They did, but we can talk about that project afterwards. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's an interesting, interesting topic. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have a mic and a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Wade Vaughn. I work for a uh, real estate tech company in San Francisco. I'll be a student at the CRE in the fall. Uh, I'm, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm curious, uh, could you talk a little bit about the progress that's been made with STOs uh, and fundraising for individual projects, um, development using STOs, and how those might be different from, uh, say, a micro REIT investing in one property? Thank you. Yeah, so... I want STOs. Yeah, can you clarify STOs just to be sure on... Oh, okay, okay. Okay, 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 sure, sure. So the way we position ourselves is eventually we want to set up an exchange meant for real estate where you can, you have, assume a world where you have like a portfolio of certain 1%, 2% in multiple properties and you can trade them in secondary market on a dedicated exchange. So REITs, REITs are different in that sense because when you are doing REITs, you are investing in a portfolio rather than a single property. I mean, there are single property portfolios, of course, but that model, we don't feel is that scalable because it's, again, limited to U.S. REITs leg legislation in U.S. is very different from other countries. Some countries don't even have that legislation there. So when you put it on blockchain, the scalability increases by, like, thousands. And eventually, the po two power of blockchain is to set up this secondary market where, which provides you instant liquidity. That is something not really possible. I mean, that is possible in stocks, for example, but not in real estate, uh, unless, like, again, uh, REITs is something that is a little different there, but technically it's not possible in uh, real estate markets there. So that is where the true value add of secondary markets and blockchain is. Thanks. Ahmed Kehan, I'm the founder of one of the uh, first data companies focusing on real estate, and I also run a real estate uh, marketplace, Zillow of Turkey, basically. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing portals in the world right now. Um, I'm in the crossroad. I'm not sure, boy, uh, millions of questions. So, uh, number one, the, regarding the real estate, when you look at the original blockchain movement, it's initially actually the idea behind it really created the movement was real estate. Hernan de Soto wrote the book, Mr. Capital, created this analogy. If you don't carry these title, these in a secure environment, we're going to have World War III, right? So how do you solve that problem? Without title deeds, the government's giving and putting all that data, title deed rights, everything, and anything related to that as well, multiply that with 200. On the blockchain, literally, what you have is only process management. That's number one. I live in Dubai, uh, between Istanbul and Dubai. So Dubai government announced everything will be on blockchain by 2020. Estonia is working on it. Uh, I invest in a company called Bitferry. We are doing blockchain for the Georgian government. In Peru, they are working on a new project. Uh, we are in talks with Egypt for title and everything. When you do that, you have something for real estate blockchain. And I think blockchain cannot be separated from Bitcoin because Cryptocurrency-wise, Ethereum everything is very different, but Bitcoin is very different in the sense that by nature, so how you link that as a token to the real estate? So the first question is that, how do you have a real estate blockchain without having the real estate's core is not in blockchain? Second is for uh, Sandy, escrows, right? So escrows, by nature, when you have fiat, within the duration of that transaction is happening, like a week, a month, in some countries it takes six months. Especially in international, it takes more than that sometimes, right? So fiat doesn't change that often. In my country, it changed lately because of the currency, dollar, etc. But uh, when you have a token, cryptocurrency, one day you might be having a 20% up and down yeah. on that currency. So how do you hedge that? Thank you.
Yeah, sure. So I'll, I, I guess I'll take the first one. Um, for, yeah, you are right. I mean, so I'll take the example, as you mentioned, about uh, how do you recall titles. So in our process, again, in an idle word, title would happen on the blockchain. But our present system is not ready. And uh, so we are trying to do a hybrid approach where we are recording title on the blockchain as well as the county office on the back end using our lawyers for every transaction is hap that's happening. I know that's, that sounds little, uh, that's a lot of work on the back end, but that, that is something that we have to do on the short term because we, we have to keep in mind the sector is evolving. It's not there yet. So we have to come up with the short term fixes. So that would eventually lead us there. So that is how we are doing that. No, so we update. Yeah, we we record it separately manually, and we keep updating it month on a monthly basis. So that's how we take care of it. And on your second question, we're actually creating a a, a separate synthetic token that doesn't trade on an exchange for that exact reason. So it is it doesn't change value. It's the only way to do it. So if you if you great great question by the way. Great. Yeah, yeah that, that's just. <laughs> So if you have a synthetic token, then what it, does it trade at a discount or a premium to the net asset value of the it, property? It's a, it's a synthetic token that's dedicated just to enable those smart contracts. So it doesn't see an exchange at all. It's just a mechanism to bring fiat in of one currency and have fiat go out, out of another currency and be able to make the transfer of that, of that token, uh, make the transfer from one person to another via the token rather than the fiat because transferring the token from one, one wallet to the next is quick and costs nothing. Whereas trying to do escrows and transfer money around different currencies, it's too complicated and too expensive. So what will be the, if you actually implement that on a property, what will be the effect on the value of the property? If you have that additional liquidity, is it what it sounds like you're talking about? Uh, I don't, I mean, I understand your question. It shouldn't have any value on the property. We're just solving the, the narrow problem of not having a trusted escrow agent. It's yeah. just to solve the problem of the escrow. And Correct. And this gets back to Tom's question, actually, like why is token required because of that reason? I mean, it in a way serves as a platform currency, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, um, which facilitates the int intra-platform transactions. It, it might not have nothing to, uh, anything to do with the outside crypto world of Bitcoin or Ethereum for that matter, gotcha. but it, it is something essential for the platform to function. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that I didn't want to go down this rabbit hole, but I'll just make it real quick about the token, our native token and what we're using it for and why do we need a token, which yeah. is the question all the funders want. Why do you need a token? Um, so what we're, the, 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 the problem that we're solving with our token is that when you're transacting at a distance and you have to find service providers to support you in that distant location, lawyers, inspectors, contractors, property managers, whatever it is, um, the way that we find those people today is really inefficient. It's word of mouth, it's referrals, it's, you know, whatever. Um, so what we're doing is we're creating, we're using our token as a way to charge and incentivize behavior. Um, so, the, so the token, um, our, our, our model for token, this is why we say it's a utility token, it's a membership model. So service providers from whatever part of the world they're in, they can buy our membership token, it, and the token, um, the payment is in the token, but it's denominated in whatever their local fiat currency is, so that we don't have to worry about our token price going up and down. If it's if it's 100 baht, it's 100 baht today, it's 100 baht tomorrow. Um, uh, and when they buy that membership, they get listed in a provider directory. And then as transactions are completed on our platform, we actually go to the exchange ourselves, acquire our native token back from the exchange, and we give those to buyers and sellers to reward them for generating user reviews. So in this way, what, over time, what we are, are aiming to do is to, is to create a global provider directory that's all user-rated, just like TripAdvisor. I think we have time um, for one more question. I have a question. Uh, I'm a broker. I do have long distance buyers from China or uh, you know, Asia countries. So uh, first question, you have white paper saying that the ICO is on July this year. Is this uh, still on target? Uh, it actually says June 21st, I think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the second question is uh, all the issue you try to resolve is really legal issues, escrow, uh, how to use currency to uh, Bitcoin to buy the property. It's really not a technology issue. I mean, those are really rely on the government to to help you to release those kind of legal regulation. Uh, it's really not how can you add, add value. I mean, your company actually ICO, people had to pay your token, actually pay more. 
instead of... Uh, yeah, I think, there's, I think there's some confusion. So buyers and sellers don't pay us to, to use the platform. It's just the service providers for the membership fee. And we're not actually trying to... Uh, we could easily enable uh, payment for property with cryptocurrency. It's, we don't want to handle any money, though. We're just providing a transaction environment for, for visibility. So if we... If, if when we team up with property portals and we just actually signed a big deal uh, with a Chinese portal, um, uh, where obviously, for obvious reasons, you know this better than anybody, um, Chinese government absolutely doesn't want to allow Chinese to buy with Bitcoin because it circumvents their capital controls. So we're not even going anywhere near that uh, subject with them. Other portals, we signed a deal with a company in London that's actually helping Northern European buyers buy into Turkey. So just, you know, go figure. Um, they actually are interested in that, in that feature. So in, you know, so in that case, what we do is we partner with another company that has that payment gateway of Bitcoin into whatever. We, that's not going to be us. I'm going to leave everyone with this thought. And uh, our wonderful panelists are going to be here afterwards. If you guys have individual questions, please feel free to come up and introduce yourselves and say hello. Hopefully that's OK. I didn't run that by you. But that should be OK. <laughs> that should be OK. Uh, I will say that based on some of the questions that we've heard today, a lot, of this, a lot of this commentary, especially within the real estate and blockchain space, started off with the idea of title. And that was a fundamental conversation. And a lot of that actually had to do with economics, not so much more of finance or anything like that, with the idea that if a person can have uh, legal title, legal ownership of their land, and that allows them to leverage that property, their most valuable asset, that land, and become contributing members of a well-functioning economy. And a lot of this is based, actually, was mentioned earlier, on some of the works of Hernando de Soto, who's also working with Bitfury, I believe, in the Georgia project. Um, but most of that stems from there. But keep in mind that because blockchain is a database system, it is susceptible to GIGO. It does not solve problems. It does not fix issues with title. And in many developing nations, and even in our nation here in the US, there's still is many issues with people participating in the established environment and in the established uh, function of how things operate here in the US when it comes to title. So theoretically, we can use technology as a way of bringing people into the formalized system, allowing people the opportunity to leverage their most valuable asset, and from there grows all these other um, important niche and uh, progressive ideas of how this could evolve the real estate industry uh, in the future. Thank you very much to our panelists and to MIT. Thank you.